just summarizing uh, what Mia just said. I work as an engagement manager at Harken, which is an um, audience um, consulting um, firm. We work with newsroom in really operationalizing audience engagement strategies and, and audience development. Um, I'm also a director of Aksakas London, which is um, a community of journalists and developers in London. We meet once a month and we do event and we discuss where is the future of journalism going. Um, before that, I was at Condé Nast International, um, which at the time was a team that regrouped um, every Condé Nast um, company outside the US. So I worked between um, China, Japan, Taiwan, Russia, India, Germany, Italy, France, UK, Mexico. Um, and I started as head of knowledge sharing there. Um, and that was a funny job title. I have one of those weird profile when, when people ask me, can you send me your bio? I'm like, oh no. Um, and my father was really excited that there was a live streaming because he said, maybe I can understand what you do. Uh, so he might be watching. Um, anyway, as head of knowledge sharing, um, I was really thinking about ways of changing the way that uh, the teams were working to really make sure that we were operating as a network and not in silo different companies and thinking about how we shared knowledge and basically build community of practices internally. And then I moved on to an audience um, editor role where I worked specifically on editorial initiatives that drives loyalty um, and on newsletters. And before that, I was at the Reuters Institute um, working on the research team. I did a report on analytics in the newsroom, um, something on online video and fact checking. And before that, I was at One Ifra as a word association of newspapers, again, thinking about the future of journalism and, and the practice of journalism. But then what you really should know about me, aside from all that thing, is that I am really obsessed with everything about news and media and journalism. And I've always been interested in what happens behind the scene. I always knew I wanted to work in journalism, and I always knew I never wanted to be a reporter. I've always been fascinated, like, how does this happen? How does the journalism machine work? What's behind the scene? What makes it, what makes it real? Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about how people, processes, and organization really come together to make journalism happen. And so I have a presentation about the, the main topic, but really what I would like to do afterwards is discuss with you, okay, if we all agree that audience is engagement and thinking about your audience is important, why we're we not all doing it, and what does it stop us to make it happen in, real, in reality in the newsroom. I'm also obsessed with newsletters. I probably receive all of them, um, and <laughs> not joking. Um, and I uh, love languages, and I'm currently failing and learning Arabic. Terrible, very hard. Anyway. Um, and I'm very curious. So I thought it was a much more like human presentation than the first one. OK, so we were talking about putting the audience at the heart of journalism. You recognize this quote. Journalists exist in the context of its audience. So that's what Frasmus said. And it's obvious, right? We all do this job because we want to tell stories, connect with the public, and if we do the best possible investigation and we shout it out in the void, well, then there is no point in having spent all of this month in really working on that. And so it's obvious, and yet we forget it so often. But I think, in, in generally speaking, across the industry, we now recognize that whatever your business model of your organization is, whether it's advertising, whether it's membership or subscription, we know that establishing a real relationship with your audience is crucial for the future of journalism and the sustainability of your organization. And we understood that the old game of reach in which you're just gonna have, want to reach as many people as possible. It's not a viable option anymore. It's a losing game with all the platform and all the possible um, players that do a way better job in targeting on advertising that any newsroom would ever be able to do. But also, it doesn't really make any sense um, to just focusing on reach for reach sake. And we have understood that really what we should do, even if your business model is advertising, is thinking about quality reach and really thinking about 
how much we know about that segment of audience. Also, I'll be talking about audience. There is no such thing as a audience. We have so many different pockets and segments of audiences comparing who reading a specific section of, of the, our site or a newsletter or radio or print. So starting to think about how we get more sophisticated in thinking about who our audience and readers are is quite important. And so that quality reach and especially loyalty. So it doesn't matter to me if a reader finds our content through a Facebook link or come into the homepage, but do they know that they are reading your organization content and not I read it on Facebook? And so that, what are the, the, the path and the behaviors that we can build so that people are intentional in coming and consuming our content and really we establish a loyalty path um, in which we start to know our audience and our readers and they come back to us all over and over again. How do we do that? Sounds great. Well, we start with working on brand recognition and really identity and values. Um, I was at a conference recently, I go to a lot of conferences, I was at a conference recently and um, we were thinking about how much the brand and thinking about the brand is something that still sits in our marketing department. Thinking about the brand of our news organization is the editor-in-chief job because the value that you have in your name and in your brand, in what you represent, uh, what your content and what your mission is and, and how that is understood and shared by your readers is crucial to start establishing that relationship. How you do that in, like, after having like, a strong identity and, and strong recognizable value, well, you have to make sure you're providing content or services or events that add a specific value. Um, and you start by building consumption habits. So I've always had one of those kind of weird jobs where I'm very much editorial, but everything I've always done is very much product, is very much uh, on user research and uh, user experience, because all of these things nowadays online are so intertwined. And so how do we build that consumption habit that we make sure we help and encourage our readers to make, we make it easier for them to come back to us and, and um, consume our content? In one word, we need to build a relationship. Let's call this engagement. Also, engagement is a buzzword. Engagement is engagement metrics. You will hear reader engagement, audience engagement, community engagement, every possible engagement. But if we try to go beyond the buzzword, what does it mean? And for me, engagement is a relationship that put the audience first, which includes questions like, do we know how our audience is? Um, you know, online we can know, um, but in, on a lot of like metrics and, and, and quantitative um, aspects of it. But theoretically, do we know who are we writing for? Um, who, we, who we expect that we like our audience to be? Um, and so engagement to me is a relationship that's intentional, so it doesn't happen randomly. I can't announce I was working on initiative that drives loyalty. And in many cases, there happened what I called an accidental loyalty path or month or target score. Because how do we know that that experiment and that content, the way we shared, the way we wrote it, is replicable and doesn't just, hasn't just happened randomly and accidentally? It's a relationship that's reciprocal and not just transactional. Too often now, with so many publishers moving towards subscription and membership, we just expect to go to our readers and say, oh, this is such a good quality content, pay for it. But we don't give them as much in return. And so it needs to be a relationship that's really reciprocal and not just transactional. And it's based on value, as we said, and it's based on trust, which you know, I know these days we talk about trust so much and what does it mean, what the trust in the public has in journalism, in news, in politics, but really building that, like establishing a relationship of trust um, with our readers is, is crucial. And that's because engagement is not a product, it's not a metric, it's not a project, it's a process that should really underpins everything we do, no matter what kind of aspect are we working on, no matter if it's a story and you're a reporter, a bit reporter, or if you think about strategy or audience and distribution, engagement is a process that should underpin everything. 
And so if engagement is a process and the relationship that puts the audience first, how do we bring that audience first approach at the heart of journalism into the reporting process? And so as I said before, I will have a few examples here of some of the newsroom we work with, some of the newsroom we don't work with, but we learn from. Um, but what I really would love to do afterwards is discussing with you how do we make it happen in reality? Because we know newsrooms are all places with a lot of structures that even if we are committed to change, that doesn't make it happen as just because we want to. So how do we make it happen? Harkin called that public power model for engaged journalists. You, there's a lot of different the definition of it. It intertwines with constructive journalism, and so uh, not just reporting on the negative side of news and the word, but really putting forward solutions and, and being constructive. Um, it's engaged journalists. There are a lot of like players in this space. Um, if you don't know, check out the work of the Engaged Journalists Accelerator um, from the EJC. They've um, been thinking a lot about this, and they have a lot of amazing case studies. But Concretely, how does the public power model work? We start with listening. And we start with listening to who? Our audience. And by building a new relationship model. Traditional journalism has kind of always been like this. We are um, approaching this newsroom as a parent. We stand up the hill. Everything happens behind the scene, and we shout to our audience, we know it best, this is what we think you should know, and here it is. <clears throat> this model treats the public as a passive consumer, children who can know who the, what they want, um, a nuisance, let's not even talk about comments and comment moderation, let's, let's, let's park it there. The marketing harm, so very easy to go and say, but now pay for it and the piggy banks. What if we changed that and we went back to journalism as a service and go about asking what you do not know that we could find out for you, right? So ultimately our job is to report and tell stories that fill your needs. So what do you need? This model leverage um, the human nature, because people are curious and creative and actually have terrific questions. Um, there is this, you know, usual thing that if you feed people links about cats and silly questions, they will only want to know about that. No, that's not true. Um, people are curious and, and seek adventure as surprise. Um, people want to be heard, seen, recognized. They want to feel that you're treating them as an individual and not just a mass. Um, and people are reciprocal. We think about it in your own personal relationship. We support back when we feel supported. And so what Harkin says is, uh, and a lot of people working in the field of engaged journalists say, is what if we change the process? So before, everything, pitch, assignment, report, publish, everything happens behind the scene. We only bring the perspective of our newsrooms um, and we publish, we hit publish, and at that point, sometimes, in some cases, we go to our audience and we ask them to comment, to share, um, but at that point, we already spent time, resourcing, effort in producing a journalist that not always we are sure that's actually what our audience want. Now, of course, if you do investigative reporting, you have a scoop, like this needs to be nuanced, it doesn't work for everything. But as an approach to me, actually it works also for investigative journalists. And so what if we change the approach? And we start by asking the question and to asking our readers and reaching out to them and say, we are writing about this topic, what else can we tell you? How can we help you understand this? And so from the beginning, the entire process starts with um, actually concretely and actively invol involving your audience into it. Um, and therefore, decrease the chances of public being upset and not really understanding what you're covering and feeling that disconnect and this um, distrust um, feeling we were thinking about. Because all of this also needs to be open and transparent. And so this is what we call our engagement ring. So the newsroom invites the public and, and to provide feedback. The public gives feedback. 
if you stop, stop here, we, you are in Haskell. Uh, because really, you only give it back if you, you, you give a newsroom, you, as a newsroom, you give a feedback back to your audience. And so if you don't thank people, credit people, alert people on how they actually have participated, that's what you want. Okay, so if this is so great, why newsrooms don't do it all the time? Because whole habits are very hard to change. And as we said before, it's not just about us being willing to. Our operation, our machine, as I said before, I'm fascinated how people, processes, organization, structure all come together and, and make this a reality. And actually, our newsroom as an operating system is very much built for a different age, uh, not for our current one. And even if we changed um, shift in the newsroom, even if we don't show up at 10, 11 a.m. anymore because the deadline is not the print anymore, still fundamentally a lot of, of the process is still like, um, optimized for a different um, era in which speed, efficiency and distribution are always uh, take precedent. Because we have this sense where we always have to feel the feed the beast all the time, <laughs> more content. One of the pieces of... Uh, of um, research and, and um, experiment I found most interesting recently is The Guardian has actually analyzed how much content they put out and they cut the amount of production and they said that it's performing better. Because when we got onto the internet, we thought that the code space is infinite and we can put more and more out. And we started again feeding the beast and just churning out more articles, thinking that, that was the success to getting more clicks. It's not. And so, new emerging operating system, you know, where it's closed networks and, 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 and chat apps like um, WhatsApp or Twitter or our smartphone are built for following us around everywhere and, and change completely our consumption patterns and really thinking about a system that's optimized for listening, relevance, and trust where we can really help the public understand what they need and the public is engaged in the process and in the decision making. What are the benefits? Well, we said it, um, the public feels heard, um, the public feels special because the, their paper, and it doesn't matter if it's the BBC or your um, local newspapers in a town of 10,000 people, there is still slim, but it's, there is still a, a perception of um, of an important institution um, in, in the press, and so you feel chosen and, and heard. Um, you feel you can have direct impact on your community and in what happens in your daily life. You have access to people uh, and to places that otherwise you don't have access to. I have a couple of examples of story that originated from readers' question, and those questions were something that, for a political reporter, for example, are absolutely obvious and is like common knowledge. That's not the same for the public, but we forget that often. Um, and again, we're building a stronger connection between the newsroom and the public, which increase in trust. For the newsroom, well, the benefit is that we actually produce more relevant content that is more differentiated from our competitors because we are listening to our audience. It's more authentic and targeted. It's free marketing because it turns out that one is genuine interest and genuine engagement from your readers. They would want to share and they would want to let everyone know that you're doing the job differently. Um, it builds loyalty and trust. You building uh, a culture of human-centered journalists. That also makes it easier for people to donate and subscribe and to really participate with their knowledge and time and not just with the money to your donors. And for the reporters, well, it turns out it's actually rewarding to write stories that people read and care about, and you can see they're having an, an, an effect on people. Um, it opens up to new ideas. We do the same job all the time, and we kind of like get caught into the system, and sometimes we don't even have the time to step back for a second and think about how we could do things differently. Well, that's a way to insert new energy and, and new thinking into it. Um, and you really feel that the relationships are um, more authentic um, with, um, with, your, with your readers. Public power um, journeys come in many different shapes and forms um, for investigative, breaking news, um, features, human interest, 
in many different formats. We've um, seen it happening in radio, in TV, in newspapers, in digital, in real life, <laughs> um, actual event where you can talk to people. Um, and so I have a few examples of what does it mean and how newsrooms do it. And I wanted to start with elections because, of course, it's quite, um, you know, I'm Italian, I'm not British, but it's very hard not to think about elections every single day, all the time these days. Um, and we worked with um, the Trusting News Project and the Membership Puzzle Project in developing something we call the Citizen Agenda, which is a guide for generating a, basically a different kind of campaign coverage, uh, which is more responsive, inclusive and, and, and useful. And it begins, guess what, with turning to the voters themselves, which actually are our readers and our users, and asking them what kind of debate and what kind of coverage they need to hear in order to cast an informed vote. This is an example from um, Detail, um, which is an online can Canadian news organization, an independent one, very small one. And um, this year, Canada had federal election. I don't know if anyone is from Canada here. Um, and so they really realized that small team, so much to cover, they couldn't possibly cover everything. And so just as a way to really focus on what to choose and what to prioritize, they turned to their readers. And they asked them through a survey to tell them what kind of question they had about the elections. They got more than 600 answers, then they analyzed them, they compiled them together, they put them back online. Um, for the readers to vote and indicate which one for them was a priority. From 600 questions, they got more than 2,000 people who participated. Um, and disclaimer, I have worked in data and analytics. I believe fundamentally in data analysis metrics. So to me, this is all theory. But all of this, this is audience development. You have 600 people coming and sending you a, f a form and filling a form, and 2,000 people voting. That's audience development. Um, and so they put them back online, they got voted, um, and then they selected six main um, topics. Um, that, sorry, it's a bit blurry. But, um, so they selected some questions, and they selected some six main topics, which they really decided to focus on as their election plan and their election coverage. And this was the idea with volunteers, they did it with people that contributed, like making the audience an active part of it. And around this, they built um, other initiative, they had a pop-up newsletter, they did an event, a debate event. And so all of this started with the idea of like, it's election time, we are gonna cover it. How do we cover it? We've always done it in one way. How can we do it differently? And also helping us in how to prioritize for our sustainability. So this is just really not something that you only need a newsroom of 500 people to do. You can have a small newsroom. Um, similarly, um, this is a public radio in New York and they um, had started a new project um, a few years ago that wanted to make sure that they were, they, they, they covered the, the area of, of um, New York uh, and, um, and they wanted to make sure that they were gathering questions about how to navigate um, civic life in New York, which included voting and election. And so in 2018, they decided to dedicate the political reporter to ask a reporter this project in which, again, people can submit different questions, what they had about elections and, and how, what does it mean to be civically um, engaged and, and, and participating in your city. That's the BBC, they're doing it right now. You might have seen it coming up in some of, of the article you're reading. Um, they have a couple of different aspects. Um, you, they either ask questions broadly about the election or you'll see it um, targeting different local regions because they want to really understand how different um, nations and, and, and part of the country are, um, um, are, um, what, what, are, what are their readers concerned about and what are the most important relevant topics. Um, again, another example is on election by um, KPCC, which is um, the Southern California Public Radio. Um, and they did, a couple of years ago, this human voter guide. Voter guide, so huge explainer, FAQ questions, where do I vote, how do I vote, who are the candidates, the buyers, what do they stand for, what do they think about the environment. And so what they did is that they decided to develop um, 
a voter guide, not just with the pre-assumption of what the journalist always did and, and following the um, you know reports or the candidates um, like um, communication and party line, but really by sourcing and question and, and, and the question from the readers, and do, so they develop a, a voter guide which looks like exactly every other voter guide, but it's very much starting from from the reader's question. Um, you know, in some cases, is again question that for a political reporter are obvious. Where do you vote? How do you vote? And you know. If there is anyone who's thinking, well, that's actually something you can Google, like, do you really need me as a journalist to spend my time to tell you that? But that's what people need to know to go and vote. So, in a way, that's also your, um, um, your role as a news organization to provide those information as better organized and, and accessible as possible. Um, again, um, KPCC did something actually taking this approach a step further. And they have started by um, having all of their reporters rethinking about why they do what they do. So every single reporter had to come up with a mission statement that says, what do they do? Um, I don't know if I can read any of this. <laughs> and so it investigates the team, the, the emerging communities, entertainment, it doesn't matter how um, serious or breaking news, the team, the breaking news team, or lighthearted your content and, and, and your topic is, everything was, they had to think about what it is the angle in which I'm covering this story or what I cover my beat. And so on top of that, they have um, engagement related goals. So each reporter has to produce at least 10% of content, which is produced with the community. That's a broad definition, but there is there has to be a community aspect in it. And really, um, the editor said that it helped a reporter to make a decision of what story to cover and how to prioritize, and also establish a more personal connection and transparency, which, as we said before, helps in establishing a real relationship with your readers. So they all have these pages in which they have a mission statement, and you can send them questions specifically about um, the, the bit. Um, another thing which I find quite interesting is that a lot of these, um, this is a um, Wisconsin and um, Michigan Upper Peninsula um, public radio. Um, I, my Harkin is based in the US, um, has been based in the US for four years and we're just starting to expand to Europe. So I've discovered a lot of public radios I had no idea existed. Uh, anyway, this is the one um, for um, Wisconsin and, and Michigan. Um, and they have um, originated by a question from a reader about um, chemicals in the water. Um, they started thinking about which was causing health problems. They investigated that. And as a result, they actually created a new reporting position. And so now they have, because they understood how crucial it was for their <coughs> community as, as a topic and how, much, and how pervasive as a topic was. Um, across the audience, and so they created um, a special dedicated reporting position um, which is dedicated to investigating everything and covering everything about the water in, in their area. Because the public can also inspire each other and spark change. So this is a story of a reader um, which asked WBZ Chicago um, a question. They have a series called Curious City uh, in Chicago which um, Harkin um, founder Jennifer Brandel um, founded when um, she was working as a journalist there. Um, and so a reader asked a question about violence um, in the city. Um, a friend of hers sees it and gets inspired by it. And so asked a question to WBZ about women's statues. Which is like, why in Chicago the statues are all of men? Where are the women? Um, so they asked the question, WVZ thought it was an interesting question, so they started like um, crowdsourcing suggestions for why there was, and developing a specific project on, on great women in Chicago. Actually, Kate was really excited that um, um, her organization, his organization, listened and, and, and did that and started sharing on social media um, how exciting it was that that project was being followed. And um, it developed in a completely different, separate project in which they started to, like, a, a bunch of people started to meet in real life and walk in, and, and think about 
what they, do, they could do together to make things change and how they can get a woman a woman's statue in, in the city. Um, and it became um, actually a sponsor project because you can also make money out of this because to back to the point, as we said at the beginning, all of this is about the sustainability of our profession and how our organization can get sustainable. Turns out there was an organization which was like the Chicago Foundation for Women and the Wing, which is a women um, co um, co-working space, were really excited about sponsoring this project and it became a specific project called a monumental shift and it became a real life engagement. And so these women started campaigning for getting statues of women in the city as actually real women. Uh, and started to go around the city, and, and, and this became the project. All started by a reader inspired by another friend who asked a question, and the newsroom actually listening. Um, so, as we said, if you, we saw a few examples, but I wanted to give you a kind of overview of how this can really be applied to anything and any part of your coverage. So it could be a general call-out, a topic base, ongoing, ongoing coverage, this is a Texas Tribune. Um, they have this project called Texplainer, in which they cover everything about politics and, um, and immigration, which is quite crucial, of course, for them. Um, they are very clear in how the process works. You ask a question, again, exactly as we see, we saw the TAI doing, um, voting on which one is more important, and, and then the Texas Tribune goes and investigates, and everyone is smarter. Similarly, uh, in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Inquiry is something about the city. And the Boston Globe um, also is doing something similar about the metro area in Boston. Um, and what I found super interesting is that this is not just a curious, um, funny project that you can do online that turned into a front page. Um, not, not curious, Philly, like in, in Boston. The Boston Globe, a reader sent a question about um, this beautiful portal in the city, um, which was kind of very mysterious, and no one really knew what was behind the door and the beautiful portal, which is part of like the city architecture. And it turned into a fascinating story, which made a front page um, on, on the paper. Um, or you can use it for breaking news. So um, BBC uses it a lot. Um, to power the existing coverage. They were, this is um, BBC Arabic, they were gonna write about the um, Egypt protest um, back in January, I think. Uh, and um, they put out one story and you know you're gonna do a follow-up because it's a developing breaking news story, so you're already planning to write about that. But they went to their readers and asked, what kind of question do you have about this, um, about this protest? Um, and, you know, if you think about um, if your publication covers different region of different areas, BBC Arabic covers Egypt, in, in which actually they are censored, so they don't really cover it because they, they are, they're not, and the website doesn't show up. But they cover a lot of different areas, and so what, kind, what an audience in a neighbored country wants to know about Egypt and the protests. Like, there's a lot of different thinking that you can, you can actually, insight you can gather. Um, Similarly, um, this was the English desk um, did on um, the Turkey offensive in northern Syria in October. Um, they got the question and then they went back to the um, diplomatic correspondent and it had a sort of a Q&A, became a big explainer with a diplomatic correspondent answering questions that help explain the, the situation. Uh, in California, with the wildfire, um, KPCC, again, used that to uh, help the readers understand what was going on um, about the wildfires. Um, it could be topic-driven, topic so you can really drill down on politics or um, new legislation that could be done at a national scale or a local town hall scale, um, and really helps you going a bit further in, in, in thinking about um, what is obvious for us, but actually our audience haven't understood yet. So these are other examples, mental health and health issues, beat reporting, you can actually ask it about um, the food scene as well as sports, um, education. Um, the correspondent takes this to a sort of like different level. Um, but very much embracing the same, the same concept. The Correspondent is now an English language publication, um, originally a Dutch publication, 
and they do they don't cover breaking news i don't know if you're familiar with them they, they call it unbreak the news because they only cover what's uh, explaining what's happening more than telling just what's happening um they rely on their readers very much their um membership based organization there is no advertising and so as a reader, you can comment and um, you, are, you can identify what's your expertise, right? If you are a doctor and you're writing, you're reading a story about health, um, you, or you about education, you're a teacher, or a professor, you will have a specific additional knowledge. And so, sorry, it's so small, but in here, basically, these are all Italians that tells um, the other readers why that specific reader is an expert on something. Um, Again, we see the mission statement back. This is uh, one of their reporters, and she says what she's reporting on and what's her mission. And again, she, you can subscribe to her own personal newsletter, which gains personalization, metrics, um, loyalty, it goes down the funnel. Um, and instead of asking um, readers to ask questions, they ask readers questions. So um, the Better Politics correspondent wanted to, um, someone asked it about a recommendation for non-white, non-fiction women writers, and she realized she didn't have as many examples. And so she turned to her readers and said, like, what would you know? Um, what recommendation would you have? And so there is a double way of, you know, we saw so far examples of readers asking questions, but also how do you ask readers questions? Another example of a reader-driven investigation is something the Financial Times did it on mental health earlier this year. This is a completely readers-led investigation. Uh, their um, their m and correspondent covers m and 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 a lot of um, um, finance stories, and he realized that by just knowing so many of his sources, and having covered the, the industry for, for, for a while, he realized it was this topic of mental health that came, kept, kept coming up, just as sort of like as an informal you know, knowledge or relationship when you, when you develop with, with, your, with your beat. Um, and then was sparked by um, a suicide by um, um, a lawyer in a, in a big law firm. And so he started thinking about, we're not talking about this enough, and yet we're talking about it informally, but we're not covering this. And so they turned to their readers. Um, of course, uh, Financial Times is a very specific type of readers, very engaged. Many of them are subscribers. Um, and so they turned to their readers and crowdsourced what kind of experience um, they had in, in mental health and in, in their law firms and, and, and what, what, how those employer were addressing burnout and stress and mental health. They got um, more than 500 um, surveys or, or feedback back. Some were anonymous, some were not. And that led to a specific investigation which the FT decided to keep um, free to read. So it was in front of the table because they thought it was a very important topic. This was completely reader-led. Um, you can engage with specific communities because also a problem of when you go and engage your readers, um, one aspect to, to always consider is that I'm only, I am I'm only talking to the people I'm already talking. How do I reach those who I'm not reaching? And so by really differentiating and being open to get more questions and then again being able to analyze the data, you can geolocalize it and kind of understand because you can ask them to tell you your uh, postcode and where they're based and you can see if there is um, a specific area of of, um, of your, um, your publication covers that you're not really addressing. Um, closing, this has, as I said, I think metrics are very important and all of this is important uh, as an editorial um, guide to me, but also on a sustainability one. Turns out that when readers are engaged and ask you a question and they kind of come back to read that story, and so it, this is an independent study uh, that um, KQED did, um, they have a series called Bay Curious, and they saw that they were like um, 11 to 15 percent um, times more page views on those stories, they were public powered, converts the newsletter sign up, again if someone takes the time to send you a question, which you know, it's not just tagging someone on a comment on Facebook or on Instagram, is taking the time to formulate a question and send you an informed 
um, thought, um, they really want to know what happens next. And so they convert to newsletter sign up. We saw the big explainers. Turns out when you do that, Google um, SEO, um, which actually favors or penalize you if you if people on Google, if you're searching um, for a question and the reader bounces back, clicks a link and then bounces back immediately because they're actually not finding what uh, is relevant for them, that actually you get penalized on that on Google, Google search. And so if you do deliver stories that actually provide the answer the person have, also very good for SEO. Convert to paid subscriber, again, um, there is, you know, with the transparency that goes through these processes, uh, it's much more likely that people will want to support. Um, and this is something from the FT Future of News conference that was going on um, yesterday. And so this says, when you focus on subscriber rather than on, on, on ad revenue, there will be less of a wall between the editorial team and the commercial teams because you are united in producing content that readers think is worth paying for. So again, we have so much talk in these past years about how journalists have never been concerned with the business of journalism and actually how current and proactive steps have been taken in to make sure that that wall was very strong and no journalist was at all concerned with how um, the paper was financed. But if at the end our, our, our objective is to serve the readers, are we not united by that goal and shouldn't we work together on that? Um, and this was like another um, tweet that happened the other day, um, which are just two examples of how people are thinking about it and how we are framing it. Um, something I don't understand about news metrics. Why do we all measure ourselves with the same yardsticks? Whether it's circulation figures or data analytics and measurement are too narrow, designed for advertiser or investor in mind, not the readers. Um, if the media's role is to inform, scrutinize, and hold power to account, why are we just measuring sales and reach? Surely more effective measurement would be how a new organization makes the target audience feel and act. Again, all of this is to say there is a discussion happening um, because the more your audience feels hurt, the more they see you are serving them directly, the more likely are they to trust you, support you, and turn to you. But as I said, what I think is going to be really interesting now is kind of discuss what stops your newsroom to make this happen. How does this operationally challenging and, and how do you make it happen for real? Thank you very much, Federico.